I'm Angie Hobbs and I'm the Professor of the Public Understanding at the University of Sheffield and I want to take a fresh look at the so-called function argument in Aristotle's Ethics, uh, Book 1, Chapter 7. <laughs> Here we have Aristotle, a Roman copy in marble of a Greek uh, bronze bust by Lysippos. Aristotle was a famously natty dresser, always looked very well turned out. Now, before we can look at 1-7, we need to set the scene. We need to look at the context. So let's start at the beginning of the ethics. According to Aristotle, Everybody agrees that flourishing, eudaimonia, is the supreme good for humans. And we need to remember that this word eudaimonia, it's, uh, it's more ob objective than our word happiness. It's more to do, as we will see, uh, with the actualization of potential. It literally means being blessed by a good daimon. Now, Aristotle says we all want eudaimonia. Well, there might be a few exceptions, but OK. The difficulty, Aristotle goes on, is saying what eudaimonia actually is. Some say it is a life devoted to sensual pleasure. Some a life devoted to honour and worldly success. Some a life devoted to contemplation. This is in Ethics 1.5. But the first, says Aristotle, is the life of cattle. The second is too dependent on the opinions and whims of those who confer honour. And in any case, those who desire honour, he says, in fact desire it as confirmation of their own excellence, their own arater, often translated virtue, hence Aristotle's virtue ethics, but in fact excellence is a, a better translation. Nor, says Aristotle, is the life of money making the end, as money is simply a means to further ends. Why do we want money? Well, to buy nice clothes, have beautiful houses, go on holiday. It's just a means to an end. So it looks as if we will end up with a life of contemplation, uh, if only by elimination, or at least a life that involves contemplation. But that option is deferred for now. 1-5 uh, does not actually provide a positive argument for human flourishing consisting in contemplation or indeed in any form of rational activity. It is simply the only option left after the other two have been eliminated as candidates. Nor, adds Aristotle tartly in uh, chapter 6, can we expect any illumination from Plato's form of the good. Aristotle did not believe in Plato's theory of forms. He, he studied with Plato at Plato's Academy in Athens for many years. Uh, they worked together, they were good friends, but Aristotle certainly didn't believe in everything in Plato, particularly the theory of forms. So that's the context for chapter 7. To resume, says Aristotle, the supreme good for humans is that for which every other action is undertaken. This is eudaimonia. It's the final end of all our actions and it is also self-sufficient. A eudaimon life is lacking in nothing. But what is eudaimonia? In order to understand the nature of human flourishing, we need to understand the human ergon, traditionally translated as function. Hence uh, the traditional rendering of this argument in 1.7 as the function argument. Just as the good and the doing well of the pipe player or sculptor are determined by their functions, so the good of humans will be determined by the human function, supposing, of course, that humans possess one. That's the key question. But is it likely, asks Aristotle rhetorically, that a carpenter or shoemaker has a function but that the human has none? And is it likely that an eye, hand or foot has a function, but the human doesn't? The human function then, he concludes triumphantly, must exist. And it must be something peculiar, idion in the Greek, we're going to come back to that word. It must be something peculiar to humans, not something that we share with plants or animals. So it cannot be nutrition and growth as we share these uh, with both plants and non-human animals. And it cannot be sensation as we share sensation with non-human animals. So it must be the practical life of the rational part of the human, 
or an alternative translation has it the practical life of a rational being. There is a little bit of discussion about how to translate uh, the Greek at this point. We are furthermore, says Aristotle, concerned here with the active exercise of reason, not just the possession of it. I mean, you might be a brilliant mathematician, incredibly good at reasoning, but if you're asleep, you're not reasoning actively. The human function, therefore, is activity, energeia, we get energy from that, is activity of the psyche in accordance with reason, with logos, or, or at all events, not in dissociation from reason. And this word psyche, uh, it's often translated soul, but we shouldn't assume that necessarily implies belief in an immortal soul that will survive the death of the body. In fact, Aristotle doesn't believe in an immortal soul for humans. Uh, so it's probably better translated something like life principle in Aristotle. And just as the difference between a liar player and a good liar player is that the good liar player performs his or her function well, then the good human will exercise their psychic faculties in accordance with reason well. That is to say, they will exercise their psychic faculties in accordance with excellence, arete. The human good is therefore an activity of the psyche in accordance with excellence. And as we have seen, this will require the active exercise of our rational capacities. OK, so that's a brief summary of the argument in Chapter 7 of Book 1 of the Ethics. Now for some questions. Why should Aristotle suppose that humans as humans possess a function at all? How persuasive is the analogy between humans and pipe players or carpenters? Do humans perform a socially agreed role? How persuasive is the analogy between humans and eyes or hands or feet? Are humans part of a greater whole and if so of what? Is Aristotle in fact assuming the existence of a cosmic designer, a cosmic god? Well, possibly, but that would certainly not fit with what he says about God in other works of his, such as the Metaphysics and the De Anima, or again, usually translated on the soul. Even supposing there is a human function, even if we grant Aristotle a human function for the sake of argument, even supposing that's true, is it true also that a human's eudaimonia, flourishing, depends on the successful performance of this function? Is Aristotle arguing from one, what it is to be a human, to two, what it is to be a good human? And is he further arguing from two, what it is to be a good human, to three, what is good for a human? In short, does the entire argument rest on an illegitimate move from a fact to a value, from an is to an ought, from a description to a prescription, the kind of move that many later philosophers, in particular David Hume in the middle of the 18th century uh, common era, had such a problem with, who thought was, this was a really problematic move. Here's a possible partial solution. Magoni in Philosophy, Psychiatry and Psychology, Volume 5, Number 3, 1998, uh, he suggests that perhaps Ethics 1.7 implicitly relies on Aristotle's doctrine of natural kinds and the essential properties pertaining to such kinds. And I want to, to develop his uh, initial suggestions. And we should remember, of course, that Aristotle trained as a biologist. He comes from a long line of doctors. And biology is his science, just as mathematics is the science uh, of Plato. The ergon of a member of a natural kind in Aristotle is to actualize its essential properties. And it is perhaps best translated as characteristic activity. This actualization is its natural goal, telos, and the achievement of its telos is intrinsically and categorically good for it. And if this is so, then a number of the standard objections fail. 
because as members of a natural kind, humans cannot be viewed simply as parts of a greater whole or as instruments or as occupiers of a non-natural role. In other words, Aristotle has not chosen his analogies with sufficient care. Nor does anything hinge on the notion of peculiarity in itself. Rather, everything hinges on the notion of the human essence, which may comprise a few peculiarly human features, but it will also and mainly comprise some features which humans share with other beings. For instance, nutrition and growth, which we share with plants and non-human animals, sensation, which we share with non-human animals, and rational contemplation, which we in fact share with God or the gods. The human essence is thus only peculiar to humans when viewed as a whole package. An idiom is therefore perhaps best translated not as peculiar at all, but as essential. Finally, accusations that Aristotle moves illegitimately from a fact to a value miss the point. He can't move from fact to value in this instance because for him, all biological facts are already value rich. His biology is intrinsically teleological and his account of the human good is thus normative from the bottom up. OK, now that interpretation does... Uh, deal, I think, successfully with an, a number of the problems that we had earlier. However, of course, it raises issues of its own. Can Aristotle, can anyone make sense of the notion of a human essence? Are Aristotle's appeals to unchanging natural kinds destroyed by Darwin? And in fact, I think this is one of the most interesting areas in current Aristotelian studies, whether Aristotle and Darwin can be reconciled. In fact, I think they can, but that's a topic for another discussion. And even if we accept the notion of essences, why should we suppose that in actualizing its essence, each living thing is fulfilling its goal or telos, and that this is an intrinsically good thing for it to do? In other words, in the language of Aristotle's physics, why should we suppose that formal and final causes coincide? The formal cause answering the question, what is it to be something? The final cause answering the question, why? Um, a final point, because however one interprets the Ergon argument in 1.7, uh, it raises some really interesting questions about what form our rational activity as humans should take. Should we focus on phrenesis, practical wisdom, uh, which relates to the ethical um, uh, virtues, or should we focus on theory, on divine contemplation? Should we try as far as possible to be perfect humans or try to be inevitably imperfect gods? I hope that what we've been discussing today has helped you to see just what a rich and fascinating argument the so-called function argument of Ethics 1.7 is and how it raises, if anything, even more questions than it uh, tries to solve. And I hope it will inspire you to continue your, your own explorations into Aristotle and into philosophy in general. And I wish you well on all your philosophic journeys and if you're taking exams, then the very best of luck. Thank you.